we were called to uh, have talks about this um, responsible, responsible AI, right? So when we, when we were submitting these proposals, I asked myself, what is responsible AI? What is responsibility actually? And uh, we all know there's a lot of lawsuits. Uh, recently, the chat GPT uh, came out, everybody talking about it. And I can see many articles saying, okay, actually, can ChatGPT even use all this public data to train and earn money, right, to do the business? Is it responsible to use it, right, if my data was used to train all those things, actually? Uh, can, can I even, even use this kind of technology? Can this technology exist? Can this technology be solved? And um, then I was diving deep into what we do in the company we have. I mean, a part of university professor, I'm also uh, involved in a company called Somin.ai. And those companies, they are very much busy with um, social media advertising. And I was thinking, how we actually use AI responsibly in our daily work. And then I went to, through two products and I tried to evaluate whether this is the case, in our, in our case at least. So this session is not technical, okay? And uh, if anybody has questions, you can just ask them straight away. You don't need to wait to the end. I hope it can be a little bit more interactive. And uh, yeah, uh, I can have a coffee with you later. Uh, we can discuss further. Uh, and by the way, this works will be also presented in a demo session on so the 1st and the 2nd of March. So you can just come in and see all the mats and the stuff if you if you like it, yeah, that's that's also you're welcome always. So uh, look at this uh, slide. So this is um, one of the breakdowns of Meta, Facebook. Meta is a great platform, but it has lots of bugs, especially when they update their new releases and they're trying to, you know, uh, uh, follow certain policies. And somebody else invites Zuckerberg to to the court again, and then he have to put another release to hide something uh, or not use something or comply with another GDPR or PDPA or whatever other thing. So they keep updating their platform and they keep breaking down. So maybe you can see, cannot see on the screen, but you will see there is that what they do, they uh, replace images with the captions of what is on an image. Um, and those captions I obviously learned uh, as an object detection or concept learning or something like that, right? So uh, if we ask ourselves, uh, does it make sense to detect concepts on every content that you upload on Meta just for the sake of putting captions on the images? Uh, most of us probably would say, uh, no, no, no. There must be some better reason for this. So yes, this is where it gets revealed, but there must be more reasons why Meta is reading every single content that we upload and uh, using it for some purposes. But what kind of purposes they are using it for? And we have more examples, like uh, here, uh, the person posting on Twitter about him being not able to see his avatar on Meta. Uh, and yeah, he said there must be somebody missing. Is it me or Jesus on the picture there? Because he, he has taken a picture uh, in one of the museums. And uh, we have uh, image recognition and face recognition technology, right? So it's always commonly applied, again, for our convenience, but also at the same time, I believe there are more than that. And uh, then after that, we can see uh, dashboards like this, where we have um, different types of interests, different types of industries meshed together, provided for businesses to let them crack uh, what type of uh, behaviors are correlated with what type of businesses. So you can see that actually uh, people who go to shoe shops, they uh, uh, often, I don't know, go to ice cream shops or something like this. Something not very relevant, but actually statistically, if you go through the whole data, uh, very closely related to each other. And uh, then we come to the place where Meta earns most of the revenues. Uh, and their revenues come from advertising. So you know that ads, they uh, are a good source of revenues if they are accurate, relevant, and therefore they uh, can convert people, right? So it's performance advertising. Let's say I'm doing lead generation. 
I want to make sure that I'm showing the ads to the people who eventually will convert, who become our maybe, uh, I don't know, uh, somebody who take a test drive of the car or somebody buy a burger in McDonald's or something like that. So uh, in order to target ads to us precisely and make them us paying for the services and to be able to sell these ads, Meta actually needs to read a lot of personal data to do so-called user profiling on each of profiles that we have. And then uh, this is the main source of the revenues. So actually, I'm quite curious what would everyone think whether using this profiling technology to actually crack our profiles and after that use it to sell our stuff is a responsible use of AI. Uh, in the personalized level, obviously, right? Because uh, every time a meta a machine learning algorithm decides to show us an ad to us or not, it actually takes our profile, uh, sees what kind of concepts and categories has been detected from it, it's the content that uh, the advertiser wants to show, does a multi-view fusion of these two, and trying to figure out how likely I am actually the one going to be buying a burger or me taking a test drive of the car. So they effectively using our profile, our personal data, internal, external pixels when we visit some websites uh, to gain revenues, to gain most of the revenues, which come, majority of those revenues come from advertising. Is this a responsible use of AI or not? So uh, then, I mean, you, everyone gonna have their own answers. I'm not gonna really judge here or whatever. But I was thinking, okay, but how to make sure that uh, you are using this data responsibly when you, let's say, on advertiser site, or how to tap into this data in such a way that you can actually make sure that uh, you are not falling under the PDP, GDPR restrictions that you are really uh, doing a good job on your site as an advertiser. And uh, then uh, we come up with a very interesting concept. You know that on adver digital advertising programmatic, there is a concept of auction. Maybe it can be displayed here, right? So we have advertiser one, advertiser two, and advertiser three, all competing to show ad for the same burger. And uh, I mean, burger is just one of the targeting audiences. This can be anything, right? It can be anything from jacket to uh, conference to computer science. It's a very, very, very broad hierarchy of most hundreds of thousands of categories. So if three advertisers competing for the same category to bid for, the one that will eventually show the ad will be the one who offers the most money to show the ad. So one offer one dollar, another one offer two dollars, and the third one probably offers three. So actually it will be the third one who's showing the ad at the price just a slightly higher than the second highest bid, the second guy. So, uh, so Meta definitely utilizes a lot of its computing superpower to make sure that uh, <laughs> advertiser three will be the one showing the ad, this guy, because he's paying the most of money, and so Meta is happy. Uh, however, how can we use this similar profiling technology in such a way that we also use it responsibly? Because we are not Meta, right? We are much smaller, and we also want to be really good and take care of the privacy. So <clears throat> here comes this picture. So I am commonly known as a person active in the marketing industry. I'm also doing academia. We are publishing papers and stuff, but I'm probably more commonly known as, as a marketer recently. And this is how you usually, I mean, this is the first time I wear a suit for the last one year. Um, <laughs> somebody told me, no, 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 you cannot wear a hoodie here, so you have to wear the suit. So. Uh, this is how I usually look. But however, marketing maybe is not the most exciting thing for me. So I keep seeing ads of marketing, all the companies trying to sell, uh, I don't know, marketing software to me or some new tricks or whatever, or courses, or, and I'm really obsessed with it. Meta is still earning on this because obviously they are paying for showing ads to me and they fight to show ads to me. However, if somebody knows that I also like to play accordion. Some deep, well, as the previous speaker say, long tail interest. 
that maybe they can actually show ads to people like me in a much cheaper cost. And if in a group level, we know that people who like marketing also like to play music, maybe, I'm just making it up, but maybe, then why don't we show ads through the music targeting, through the long tail, long tail targeting, it, instead of just trying to fight for me uh, as a marketer or as a computer science researcher or something like that. So then in a similar situation here, we're gonna get ads shown at much cheaper cost here to the first guy, who instead of targeting burgers, start targeting, let's say, pastry. Or let's say if in the, they are in Singapore, they might be, will be targeting curry puff. Or uh, instead of fighting for coffee, like a black coffee here in Singapore, they will be targeting for kopi o koson, you know? I mean, those who are not in Singapore, you can go canteen and try to pronounce kopi o koson, then you'll know what you'll get. Uh, kind of a local coffee or something like that, right? Something very local, something very relevant, but not yet in a trend so that everybody fights for this auction. And then you can actually use AI in a much more responsible fashion when you, uh, in the group level, try to understand what are the categories that are co-occur and correlate to what you want to originally fight for, but you can get it at a much cheaper price. That's called long tail advertising. And this only makes sense when you do it in a group level. It doesn't matter that I like accordion. It doesn't matter that, uh, I don't know, uh, my PhD students who are sitting here, they like, I don't know, cycling or one of them I know uh, likes to cook, to do cooking. Yeah, it doesn't matter. But if all PhD students in computer science are pretty much like to do cooking, at, at least when they come from China, then that is something that you can target and that actually you can do a much better job in advertising when you do uh, this kind of uh, sales and targeting to them. So uh, then you got a lot of these interests and I commonly show this dinosaur uh, as a concept. So you have a long neck and a long tail. You really don't want to fight for, their, for the neck for something very expensive and uh, uh, more, more generic. You want to go more specific, like music, like accordion. And uh, you want to do a lot of these categories so you can leverage on this long tail and get your ads at a much cheaper cost. And then uh, the system that we built actually doing exactly this. It replicates the uh, process that Facebook is doing on their side. But instead of uh, figuring out what is the common knowledge, what it does, it uh, mines the social media data from followers of the brand. And then in the second step is use computer vision to profile the data, to understand what's really happening there, what are the true interests of these people. That what's happening in the third part is uh, it gets people grouped in the groups, like what kind of interests co-occur with each other, what kind of common things are happening there, and then it runs the ads. So in my opinion, when you utilize the data in a group level, when you don't push stuff to people individually, especially when you utilize their public and private data. That is a responsible way of using AI, uh, especially user profiling AI. When you go deep into individual profiles, then that's become a tricky question, and that's why probably there are so many lawsuits happening around meta and similar advertising platforms. However, uh, there is a, a public part of this, and I'm now going to talk about a slightly different uh, type of product here, right? So we could actually see the results of these ads that are run on, on the meta. So like advertisers, for example, uh, in our company, we run millions of dollars of ads every month. And we can see what kind of ads result with what kind of click-through rates, conversion rates, and all these metrics. So this is a private data from the advertisers, but it's leveraged on the group level. So meaning that you don't take anybody's personal ads. You're not gonna take Audi's ads to run, uh, full, uh, let's say Volkswagen campaigns or BMW campaigns and vice versa. But can this data be used to uh, do some cool stuff that is useful for the, for the advertisers, let's say. Apparently we could do so and we could train something like prediction of the quality of the ads. So if you have lots of data about what kind of ad performed well and not well, you can actually train a model to predict what kind of ad will work well in the future even before it runs. And let's say you can predict a, a CTR, click-through rate, or something like that. Uh, so, all right. So for McDonald's, for example, it helped to increase the conversion by 36%. Uh, 
So by just not wasting money on something that doesn't work, they were able to uh, save lots of budgets and reutilize it in a much better way. Uh, so, okay, then uh, how does this can be married together with even more creative and uh, uh, hypey type of AI that nowadays we are dealing with and we see everywhere? So let me show you. I was promising that I'm going to talk about GPT and chat GPT here. So uh, you can see that this is a Facebook ads library. This is a place where brands uh, can see what kind of ads they are advertising for transparency reason. And you can see that for every single ad, if you use a model that predicts accuracy or predicts the success of that, you can actually see which ad is going to work well and not well and also why. We all uh, do neural networks. We know the attention networks, right? We actually can predict what kind of content is going to work for who, what kind of customer, what kind of brands, and also why. And we can do attentions for the text. We can do attentions for the images. We can literally even go beyond the eye tracking, but rather into the psychographics of the people because sometimes we might click something, but we might not sure why we did that because there was some object or some text somewhere in the ad. And then when we take the best performing ad, here is a true magic happening. Let's say this ad's predicted to perform the best. We can actually use this ad to generate a lot, a lot of new content. And actually we can pre-train and guide generative networks to generate a content similar to what already works for us or predicted to work very well. Moreover, here effectively, I mean, I'm not sure you guys can really see it. I cannot really see it very well, but what we are doing here, we are actually taking, uh, I guess, uh, Zara ads, the, the Zara brand, right? And we are uh, then replacing brand with Adidas and replacing product with the shoes. So now we effectively predicted what kind of ad works best for Zara. And then we use that style to, but basically we're kind of stealing the style of the best performing ads, replace the product automatically and generate lots of copies that later can be used for advertising. They're all statistically much of higher chance to perform very well compared to if we just use our gut feeling. And we can change it for Instagram or for different types of personalities of people. All these kind of things, GPT-3, chat GPT and other uh, networks can actually handle. But why would we stop here? If we can generate text, if we can predict what works the best, we can also generate uh, visual content, right? So now, for every single uh, text content that we have, we are going to generate visual content. So now we got our text, and also we got our visuals, and they're all copyright free because they were just generated just now. They are not, you can search them in Google and you wouldn't find it anywhere. And you have a very good inspiration of what kind of new content you can use for your ads. And you can see the actual visuals that you can use for your ads as well. So then the loop continues because everything you generated, let's say thousand different uh, content, uh, text and stuff, that can be fed back to the system that scores content and predicts which of them going to work well. And you're going to use them for your ads. And then you're going to... Uh, uh, generate more and more. So it's kind of continuous process that improves the digital advertising and efficiency of it automatically, almost without human involved insight. Uh, and if you couple that with the targeting of the ads, not for the very common categories as I explained before, but for something uh, more psychographically interesting for the people, you can also get it at a cheaper cost. So <laughs> this application is, uh, in my opinion, quite, uh, quite on the border, because from one point of view, we are, are having it, uh, we are having this application uh, mining all their public data or an aggregated level. But from another point of view, who say that ChatGPT have a full right to get the data from all the internet and actually use the data to train and especially to make money? And also at the same time, who say that those content that has been produced doesn't have some parts 
that actually form a copyright from the original content that has been copied uh, in order when, when, the, when the model was trained. Uh, so what I would like to conclude this talk with is a very funny thing that um, that I learned uh, yesterday from one from my head of sales. Uh, they do a lot of business outreach, and they recently use uh, ChatGPT to personalize emails to people. And uh, they use some software, some tool that helps them to utilize ChatGPT a little bit faster. So what they did, they took uh, all the content that they were using in the past, and they fit it inside the tool, and they asked the tool to summarize and produce a few more uh, examples related to marketing AI, the field where we are active in. And what the tool has produced was post-human marketing. And this is a little bit scary because I really don't want to live in the area of post-human marketing. I'm not sure even there is a place for me in the post-human marketing. So uh, what I wish to everyone is to be very cautious about what you're doing and be responsible for AI that you apply because the technology nowadays, they uh, develop way faster that than the policies and then our minds. And we can be too creative as a computer scientist. We'll be too creative and too involved in cracking a new cool stuff. And sometimes maybe we might pass the borderline, which we don't want to pass because that's already tapped into the ethics. And we all have to remain humans and we don't want to live in a post-human marketing world, at least for the time being. I wrote an article on Forbes. You can scan the QR code and you can read about it more if you want to, and I'm very open to your questions. Thank you.